How's it going, everybody? And welcome to the Land Wan Show, episode number three. Now, you might be asking yourself, why is there no webcam? Uh, it broke, actually, and I'm waiting on getting a new one. So, in this video, I wanted to cover something that I constantly get asked, and is a constant battle for anyone that does any type of certification preparation. Whether it is that you're going for a degree program, a technical certification, a diploma, if you're going for something in any field that requires you to uh, go out and learn a bunch of material, retain that information, and then be able to regurgitate it when you need to, there's no easy way. The human brain, for whatever reason, depending on who you are, may be geared to learning. Other times, it's total, it feels like you're, really, again, I don't remember what that command is. Well, I can tell you right now, I am studying for my service provider CCIE. I have a CCMP in service provider, so I'm already most of the way through. What I'm doing now is I'm taking a deep dive into each one of the technologies. I'm using my buddy Nick's book as I read through. Now, here's the thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands. When you are going through your preparation, and and I want to um, I want to disconnect it from it being an IT thing, because it could be you might be studying for. Uh, a medical degree. You might be studying for something in the mechanical industry. You might be becoming a mechanic, or you might do, you know, uh, programming CNC machines. You know, it, it doesn't have to be IT focused. Um, but when you're studying for something, how do you combat the always looming "I don't want to lose it" feeling? And to be honest with you, there's really no way to not feel that way. So I created this little study guide, and you guys can uh, follow along if you would like. But I wanted to create the IT certification study guide because obviously I work in the IT field, and I want to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. So at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're feeling like we actually were, uh, our time was spent uh, on topics, and our time was well spent because you know obviously we only have one life to live, and it's one of those things where if you spend your time on YouTube and Facebook all the time when you should be studying, well, obviously, the effort you put into it is the, is the result you're going to get out of it. So it's one of those things where it, there's going to be a certain level of dedication to this whole thing called IT. Now, the only drawback to this is that when you're going through and you're learning these technologies for the first time, there's going to be a learning curve that you're going to have to deal with. I mean, there's just no way of getting around it. It's going to be there whether you like it or not. And that's the, uh, and what is actually kind of funny is I actually did some, uh, I went to, when I was going to school, I ended up befriending a gentleman that was in one of my IT classes that had just taken sociology and psychology. And so we were having a discussion about the, how the brain, the the actual like muscle in your skull, how it uh, how it retains information because it's a sponge. At the end of the day, a brain is just a big sponge, and what you're doing, and I didn't know this, is there's actually little um, receptors in the brain. And now what you're doing when you are learning something, you're building synapses. You're basically building bridges between point A and point B, and these synapses. Are built now. What's kind of funny is when you have the synapse built. Think of this like a if you were to take um, take a like an extension cord. You have an extension cord, or you take a your cell phone a wall charger and you plug it into the wall. Well, basically that's what you're doing. You're making a connection there, and then whenever an electrical signal rides over that, that is a memory. That is a uh, it's a memory. It's you're remembering something that you did, whether it's you know a birthday. You know, uh, you remember what two plus two is, or you remember that you have to enable uh, Ceph in order for MPLS BPN to work. You know, regardless of what it is, you're it's you're it's a memory. It's in your brain. You've retained that. Now, just like a hard drive in a computer, there is a seek time. There is a cache. There is the obviously the the more commonly um, commonly used things are going to be at the forefront of your brain things like that. So one of the things you're going to find is 
the more you cover something, the more uh, the more quickly you'll recall it. And so people ask, I've been told that I have an encyclopedic understanding and ability to recall information that I've studied. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But do you know how I went about to get that level of understanding? It's not that, you know, I'm any better than anybody else. It's not that I'm a great test taker or that I, you know, I sit there and I, you know, I read the documentation word for word until I get it and then I lab it and then I know it and then I'm good to go. What it is, it's a combination of multiple uh, inputs and multiple outputs. So one of the things you see me doing here is I'm recording a video talking about how it is that I study. So I'm talking. It's an output, right? So I have the input. I'm watch, I watch videos on, t on technologies. I just finished watching a couple YouTube videos on segment routing. You know, there are videos that are very, very dry. There's no humor in it. It's very technical, but it's giving me to the point information that I want to know. Is segment routing on the service, service provider written or lab exam? No. But what it is, it's inside of the scope of a service provider. So I want to know it because it might be something that I see in production. So it's something that I'm learning about because it's interesting. I find it interesting because it's MPLS traffic engineering to the next level. So when I'm going through and I'm learning something, I watch a video to get, because sometimes when you read the documentation or you read an, uh, an RFC or a standard standards body documentation, it's very dry. Sometimes it's very hard to under decipher what it is they're trying to say. Or maybe there's so many different little variables that they're throwing in there. It's hard to kind of find a linear way to read through it so that you can comprehend the information that they're trying to you know, put in this document. Well, that's kind of how RFCs are written. They're supposed to be that for a reason. To each their own. So an input is you watching a video. You reading. You uh, tr trying it out on the command line. Because when you're doing a... Because for every input that I have, I try to have an output of that information. Because then you've got a full cycle of the brain. Because one, it's one thing to take information in and never let it out. But here's the thing. If you're only doing one way, if you're only trying to do this one way, you're really not getting a full, a full cycle of the material into your brain. So here's the thing. Whenever I'm learning something new for the first time, I read about it. I see if I can find a video on it, whether the video is, you know, regardless of the vendor it might be through, I try to find a video on it to, you know, because there's been technologies that I just, I just don't get. I really just don't get the, what it is that um, is being, trying to be conveyed, whether it's in print or it's some sort of online doc. You know, I have an iPad that I carry with me almost all the time. And the iPad is great because I can load it up with PDFs. I've got like 32 gigs of hard drive space on it, so I've got plenty of PDFs on it, and I have Adobe Reader on it. So as, if I'm sitting at work and I've got some downtime, I'm reading through the iPad. You know, if I'm on a call and I'm just I'm just there and I'm there for support or moral support or whatever, I'm reading through it. You know, I've it's something to I'm always trying to add little nuggets. One of the things that I highly recommend that everybody do is take the material trying the material you are trying to learn and take it into little bite-sized pieces because i i often equate the input to how much you know to to a meal so try to find a topic or a um okay let's say find a topic and at some point you're going to have to take and maybe that topic is OSPF OSPF is a bunch of material there's no way that anyone out of the gate is going to be able to sit through 30 hours of video. I could easily put together 30 hours of video on OSPF and still have more to go. That's how involved OSPF can be. With troubleshooting it, explaining how it works, debugging it, OSPF is a massive protocol. So instead of sitting there and, you know, an overview video might be half an hour. So let's say, how long does it normally take somebody to eat? Half an hour, right? Well, if it takes you a half an hour to eat something, I usually sit there and I take, that is one topic that I try to cover. What is OSPF? 
Maybe you're trying to understand how stub routing in OSPF works. Well, if I'm learning, trying to understand what stub routing is, you know, I want to know what it is, how it works, where you would use it, why you would use it, when you would use it. And those answering those questions are really going to help. So one of the things that I want to make sure everybody understands is how do you not how to not lose what you just learned. So if I'm learning this material, I try to break it up into bite-sized pieces. So for instance, if I'm going to have a hamburger, fries, and a, and a soda for lunch, I'm going to eat the hamburger, the fries, and, the, and I'm going to drink the soda. Now what I'm usually doing is after I'm done with that, after a period of time, chances are I'm going to have to go use the restroom. So whenever I'm learning something new, I'm taking the information that I learned and I'm jotting down bullet pointed things on it. For instance, I'm talking about what STUB is. Is, is STUB an acronym for something? Well, in this case, it's not, but it could be. Um, am I, what is, uh, what is it doing? And I'm starting to take the, I've in, taken input and then I have a little bit of output. I'm giving back a little bit of information to my, uh, I'm doing a full cycle on the, on the material. Something is coming in, I'm putting something back out, whether it's, you know, um, I'm, I'm writing about it or I'm putting it, recording a video on it, whatever. I'm, there's some sort of output. So I'm trying to do something like that. So one of the things that you'll, I often get is often you learn something, feel great about it, then two weeks go by and you forgot it. Well, the reason why you forgot about it is because it was your first pass through it. Or well, let's say um, it was well, let's say it was your first pass. Well, on average, the first time you learn something, you're gonna remember twenty percent of whatever it is you, you learned. So if you learned how OSPF stubs work, if it was the very first time I had learned about OSPF stubs, I'm not going to fire up a video, title it CCIE, and then go teach it. Because I don't know it to that level. I might know it to the ICND one level. I'm going to go through and I'm going to cover that material five, six, seven times before I actually get to um, get to do anything with it before I teach it because I want to know more about it than just what it is. So I often will sit there and I will take that information and I will go over it uh, several times. So if you have a situation where you learn something and then two weeks later you touch it again, well. The problem you're going to have is human beings are a creature of habit. Okay, I have a habit of coming to my office after dinner and I read, I lab, I document. I've got something in the neighborhood of like 40, I think it's like 50 something blog posts that I've done in the past two months. And the reason why I'm blogging is because of the fact that it might be beneficial for somebody on the internet that's trying to do a search on something that you know may not be very well documented. I'm reading through my friend Nick's book. His book is like been super helpful because there's been several times where I've well, you know I've read through it. I'm like, oh, that's what they mean. You know, it would have been sometimes. Sometimes I can be very dense and not get something, even if I read it three, four, five times. And I'm like, why do I not understand this? You know, it's one of those things where if that's a situation, I need to I need to handle that. So. The thing that you really need to focus on is being repetitive and being routine. So, you've retained a bunch of material. How do I keep it fresh? Well, you don't keep it fresh by letting it sit. Okay, things get stale, information gets old, you forget parts of it. I am constantly going over and redoing things. What do I mean, what do I mean by redoing things? Well, normally what I do in a, in a common scenario is, especially when I was studying for routing and switching for that for my a CCNA, CCNP, and CCIE, I was routinely building new topologies. So I would build a new topology and I would start off with layer 2 switching. I would make sure that my VLANs were in place, my trunks were good to go, VTP was propagating information where it needed to go, I had the right access ports configured, etc. Then I could connect the, my routers to the topology, and then the routers would start sending information back and forth to each other. They would form routing adjacencies, and then you'd be able to go to the next level. 
the thing that you really need to focus on is you need to be you need to be um, consistent. Consistency is a big thing because you know, and you might say, well, you know, if why are you rebuilding your your lab? Are you are you afraid that you're gonna you know something's gonna happen? Well, no, but it's it's the, the constantly rebuilding it and having to do it over and over and over again moves it from being something that you kind of understand to something that you know second hand. It becomes second nature for you. It's not something that you want to have and go, well, you know what? I'm really not sure. The way that I always test myself is, excuse me, can I go through and if somebody was to ask me a technical question on this topic, can I answer it? If somebody was asking me, what is Spanish Tree Protocol? I'm going to tell them it's a layer two uh, loop prevention technology or mechanism. You know, and which version of Spanish Tree are you referring to? And then I start to ask them questions and start to draw more information out of them. Because one of the things that you'll find, and it, this happens over, over the course of time, is a lot of people I know have gone through, they have started learning a technology. Like, for instance, you take the CCIE Writing and Switching Version 5 Blueprint. That blueprint is massive. Okay, so people typically and will, will have gone through it in a linear fashion. They'll do layer 2 switching. They'll get that all up and running. They'll get into um, layer 3 routing. They'll spend, let's say they spend a month on layer 2 switching. Because there's really not that many topics to cover. So a month, if you were to spend every night, uh, let's say you spend five nights a week studying. And you go four hours a night. So you spend 20 hours a week dedicated to your prep. I spend more than that on average. I spend closer to 25 to 30 hours a week studying because I don't ever take a day off. I'm just that kind of guy. Um, you spend that many hours a day studying and you take two days off, which is fine. If you need a two-day break, hey, more power to you. Monday through Friday is your work week and then the weekends are yours. Hey, I got no qualms with that. If that's your study plan, I'm happy for you. You spend a month on layer two switching. Then you get into layer three routing. You spend six months on that because you got yeah, RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, BGP, protocol independent routing. And then you've got tunneling and then static routing and some other stuff that's out there. You take all those components and then you've gone through them. So let's say uh, RIP takes you two weeks. Let's say that uh, pro protocol independent routing takes you two weeks. You take EIGRP, it takes you a month. OSPF takes you a, a, a month and a half. BGP takes you a month and a half. By the time you know it, you've just blown through four or five months. So you spend four or five months. You're six months in, and you've covered switching and routing. That, that that's actually a pretty good time span, if you ask me. And then you jump into VPN, MPLS. Then you get to you know, let's say you spend a month on multi on MPLS. You spend a month on VPN. You spend a month on IPsec. You spend a month on services, and you spend a month on security. Then you spend another month on, on uh, management. There's a year. You spent a year going over the material one time. Then when you get to management, 9, 10, 11 months after you hit layer 2 switching, then you go back to layer 2 switching, and you wonder why you can't remember what the command is to disable the listening and learning attribute at the link level of an access port. Which, by the way, is Spanish report fast. You wonder why you have a hard time remembering that. Well, here's the reason why you're having a hard time remembering that. Because you spent almost a year not touching it. Because sometimes your job will dictate that you don't touch layer, th layer 2 switching. You're a layer 3 guy. All you do is deal with routing. So if you're constantly in one area and you're focused on that, you're naturally going to be better at it and quicker at it then you will on something you don't touch. It's just human nature. This is how we're built. Well, here's the thing that I change about that. When I spend my 40 hours a week at work doing my job as an architect and an and arch engineering architect, I then come home, I spend 20 to 30 hours a week on top of that, and I'm learning new material. I am a self-studier till the day I die. Simple, it's who I am. I'm probably never going to give, give it up. And I'm always going to go for it because it's something that I, I have a drive for. It's a, it's 
I guess you could call it, it's an obsession of mine. I really enjoy doing it. So I take that information, and there's always new stuff coming out, so I'm always having to learn new stuff. You take these technologies, and instead of you going layer 2, all of layer 3, MPLS, VPN, IPsec, multicast, quality of service, services, security, management, and then you come back and you do layer 2 switching you know, a year, uh, a year later? No, don't do that. Break it up. You do layer 2 switching. And then you do RIP. Okay? And then what you do, and let me go ahead and draw this out a little bit so that you guys will have a visual aid as we're going along. And my last bullet point here is, what is it that I always, or why is it that I always feel overwhelmed by certification blueprints? Because you're looking at them as a start-to-finish guide, which is what they really are. They are a start-to-finish guide. But here's the thing. If you treat them as a start-to-finish guide, when do you get to a point in your preparation to where you take a break and you and you go and you um, you go back to something you haven't studied in a while? Let me look at it. Look at it from the perspective of a college degree. Okay, you don't have a you don't go to class twelve weeks in a row and then take one test. You're taking a bunch of individual tests along the way, right? You're gauging your progress based off of a test. How much do you remember? Well, here's what I end up doing. And this is, what do I do, Rob? Well, here's what we're going to do. Let me go ahead and pause the video. I'm going to bring back my pen pad. And I'm going to draw some stuff out for you guys. So one of the things that I really want you guys to understand is the, the point at which you should start drawing a line in the sand and saying, you know what? Okay, this is a cut point. This is where I need to, uh, you know, stop what I'm doing and take a break. All right, so that's, let me go a little bit thicker here. So here's what I would do. So let's say, let me go ahead and break down the um, the blueprint. So we have layer two, you have layer three, you have, um, underneath that you have IGP, then you have BGP, then you have protocol independent routing, then you have, um, once you've gone through that, then you have the next step, which is you go through and you say you have uh, VPN, then you have MPLS, then you have, uh, what's that other than that, the MPLS, oh, uh, multicast, then you have multicast, then you have QoS, then you have services, security, and then you have management. So you take all these topics and you have to go through each one of them. Well, here's what I normally do. Let's say, for instance, you take this and you take a topology where you start off with just a couple of, let's say you start off with a couple switches. You start off with a switch here, a switch here, and a switch here. That was a horrible switch. And I can't backspace because I'm using my pen pad. So I do this. And then you create R1. And you have R1 connects here. You have R2 connects here and you have R3 that connects over here. This is what I would do. And then what you do is you have switch one, you have switch two, you have switch three, etc. You do your VLANs, trunks, port channels, you do your VTP, and once you've gotten all that you do your spanning tree. You know, you, you play around with it. Now once you've done that, that's this is layer two. And then you've done your RIP. Then you go into, you do IGP. Let's say you do, you do RIP first. So you do, you start off with RIP. Maybe you do RIP on these three routers to keep it simple. Maybe you add a point-to-point -point serial link between these two to test out some other features and see how RIP handles PPP and HDLC and things like that. Now what I would do is I would say, okay, great. Now here's what you do. You take and you add on a couple switches. You add on switch four. You add on switch 5, then you add on switch 6, and then you do this, and then you draw a port, you do a port channel here, maybe these guys are port channel together, and then you take this, and now this could be for CCNA, it could be CCMP, it could be CCIE, I really don't care what where you're at, this is just a way to do this. Then what you do 
is you take this information here and then you add routers. You come over here and maybe you add R4 and they do you know R5 and then you do you know R6 and then maybe you do R7 you take that. Now this is all EIGRP, right? You do EIGRP over here. Now, here's what I'm going to do next. I want to go and take this to the next level. I want to start, uh, so it takes you a month to do, because uh, now what you've had to do is you've had to redo layer two. So you recovered layer two. Now you're hitting EIGRP. And now you've started to, you still have to play with e, uh, Ruth Rip because you got some redistribution here because right now you're running EIGRP in uh, let's say, for instance, um, let, let's say that you are running RIP is here. Oop, um, I can't erase that. Let's just say, let's assume for the moment that that's right. And then you've got, let's say you got EIGRP running over here. So now you've got this guy running here. So EIGRP is running here. So now what do I do? Well, now I need to, I need to do OSPF now. Well, what I do is I take this guy over here and I run another switch, switch 7. I do switch 8. And then I do switch 9. And then I take this and I do R8. I do, you know, R9. And then you do R10. And then you take this guy and you've got those connected. And then you come over here and you do another switch. So this is switch 10, and you draw another router over here. Get R11. And then you go and maybe you've got your OSPF area zero, you're doing this, you're doing some stub over here, then you say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, let's say you do stub, stub here, and then you do, you know, maybe off this one you do, maybe another switch here, and then maybe you do, so it's R12, Maybe you do NSSA over here. You do something along those lines. And then, okay, well now I want to go ahead and I want to go and draw another router over here. Maybe I draw R13 here. And then this is going to be, you know, you do virtual links here. Well, actually, that wouldn't that wouldn't work because you're going over in a not-so-stubby area. Well, maybe you scrap NSSA. Or maybe you don't draw it here. Let me go ahead and erase that real quick. And maybe you... So let's just erase that for the moment and go back and grab my pen again. Now I am doing this completely on the fly. I did not plan this out. I'm just drawing it as I go. Maybe you draw over here. Maybe this is a virtual link. Maybe this is, you know, uh, maybe you've got a loop back that you create and you put this into another area. You know, maybe this is another area. You do your virtual link here and you do your testing. You could feasibly do OSPF on this size of a topology. Now you've done OSPF here. And now what you've got to do, let's go back to white real quick. Maybe you've come in here and you've connected R8 to R5 and you've connected, you know, R9 and R4. Maybe these guys are talking. Now you got redistribution. Then you come in here and you got that. So I've got all of this is OSPF, right? So now I come in here, I go, all right, cool. So now I've done all of my IGPs. Now I need to focus on BGP. Now I've got all these connections here. Maybe I draw, I draw uh, two routers out here. I do router, uh, let's see, 14, uh, and I do router 15, and then I do these guys here, and then I connect 15, to, or uh, I connect 14 to 11. I connect, um, you know, 14 to 9, and then I connect 14 to 15, and then I have, say, R16. I have R17. I have R18, and I have, I connect these guys together, and then I go through and I do this. Hey, do you see where I'm going with this? Then I have some switching over here. And maybe these guys are connected to each other, and then there's some port channels on the back side. So again, I'm doing layer two switching again. So I've got, this would be switch, switch 11 and switch 12, and then... I come up here and then I'm doing DMBPN. I run DMBPN over that and I've got BGP as the underlay. I've got something along those lines. I take that and I've got those pieces coming in. And then I come up here and I have more switching up here and you know more switching over here. So this is, would be switch 
13 and switch 14. So I've got all these switches connected here. They're propagating. And now I've got, maybe I've got BGP around here. Maybe this is my BGP domain. Let's say this is, you know, this is a BGP AS. Maybe this is a BGP AS. And then maybe you're doing OSPF here or something along those lines. There's multiple ways of getting the job done. So now I've covered all the IGPs and I've just continually grown the network in a scalable manner. Now, would you do this in production? No, not even close. But the point is here, you've consistently added to what you had growing. The reason here is you've consistently added and added and added. Before you know it, you've got this huge environment. And now if you really want to get into troubleshooting, you've got troubleshooting aspects. So now I've got this point here, maybe I'm doing, I go ahead and I've got, yeah, that's that's RIP. So let's just say, for instance, for the sake of argument, yellow is my DMBPN. Maybe I've got two hubs. Maybe I'm doing 11 is a hub. I'm doing that to 18, 17, and I'm doing that to 16. And then I've got nine going to this guy here, here, and here. Maybe I'm doing dual DMB, DMBPN hubs. You're learning how this stuff works. So you could do that. And then what I could do, is after I've done all this, then you can go into MPLS. But the point is, and let, let's just say for instance, the moment you go to MPLS, I'm gonna walk you through the entire um, the entire blueprint, just so you guys have something to, to work with. So I have something along those lines. You can mix it up as much as you'd like. It's up to you and how you go, how far you go. So let me go ahead and take, um, go to the thick uh, eraser. So let's say for instance, okay, so now we've done, actually, let me go back over here real quick and you've done OSPF, you've done BGP, you've done DMBPN, and then you've done some more switching on the back end, so you got some more switching over here. So all, all that's great, you know, you've got, you've got all these things you've touched, you, know, you touched the entire blueprint, you've added to it, added to it, added to it. Now, let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to, well, actually, you know, yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, race this real quick. I'll pause the video as I want to, until I get, until I'm done. So now we get into a situation where we need to want to, we want to get into the next step, which is we've covered, we've covered layer two switching repeatedly. We had to add switches. We had to add VLANs. We had to add trunking, etc. Then we did all the IGPs. Right? We did GRE tunnels, we did policy route based routing, we did all that type of stuff. We did VPN. So this is all done. We covered that. I don't know how long it took you to cover it, but you covered it. So again, we do. We, we have the situation now that we need to go through and we want to go and do MPLS VPN. Right? So, so you've done MPLS VPN, you're, you're going to do MPLS VPN. So you have R1, you have R2, you have, you know, let's say you've got your switches here. I'm going to draw four of them here. These aren't going to be doing anything spectacular, just some interconnectivity between these boxes. And then you've got, let's say you got R3 over here. You've got R4, R5, and R6. And then you've got CE1. That's supposed to be CE. CE1. One, you got CE2, you got CE1. So these guys connect up here to these guys, and then these guys connect up here to here. And then you're fully connected at that point, so you have to go through the switching environment in order to get to the other routers. And then you've got the connection like this, where Let's say three connects to here, this guy connects to here, and this guy connects to here. Maybe now you're doing MPLS. So this guy here is a provider. This is a provider edge. This is a provider core, provider edge, provider edge, provider core, provider edge, right? And then you do all your MPLS stuff. You do your, you know, you do your LDP. You do your VRFs. You do your VPN v4 etc you go through and you do something along those lines you test out you know both static routing you test out bgp you test out 
IGP, and these are all the PE to CE routing protocols. You test them all out. You make sure that you can get end-to-end -end reachability. You play around with just the basics of LDP. You play around with authentication. You play around with uh, TTL propagate, you know, things like that. You play around with technologies that are very simple to work with, something you might actually get tested on in the written in the lab exam. Now, you've you spent a month on this, but what you've also covered is you've covered layer two switching. You've covered VLANs. You've covered trunking, port channels, VTP, uh, spanning tree. You've covered IGP. You've covered uh, whether this is, and I would I would play around with it. I would make sure that you can, can configure EIGRP in the core, RIP in the core, OSPF in the core. Now, you're likely not going to use EIGRP and RIP in the production networks, but it's not the point. You're studying for the CCIA lab, or you're studying for a certification, so you want to make sure you cover the material anyways. So you go through that. So you take that to the next level. You take that information. You've covered this all over again. So now you've gone, this is a second path, a second pass through this, and now you've probably added some, some technologies that you haven't covered yet. You probably added VRF Lite because inside of MPLS, you might have done multi VRF CE where you had to use capability VRF Lite in order to disable the down bit in OSPF in order for the route to propagate down to the CE. You know, these are things to, to think about well, actually, it, it wouldn't be propagated. It would already be here just in, to inject it in the routing table. These are things to keep in the back of your mind because now you've recovered it again. So you haven't you haven't been stale for for six months and haven't touched layer two because you've been you know you're not you're afraid to break a lab. The lab is meant to be broken. The lab is meant to be messed with. I mess my lab up every day, but I fix it every day. So. But I'm fixing it because I'm learning how the technologies work and I'm like, okay, now I remember that. It might take me a couple seconds to think about it because it's still maybe new or relatively new and I'm having to go through it. So you've gone through all the IGPs. You've gone through layer two. So you've recovered this all over again. You've had to do PGP all over again. But now you're lear learning the VRF or P components of it as well. So you're expanding on what you already knew. You're taking it to the next level. So you've got that. Now, let's go ahead. I'm going to pause the video again. I'm going to erase one more time. I'm going to do set up this set up the network again in a IGP setup and we're going to go ahead and take a look at it from multicast QoS etc. So now we're going to go ahead and I'm going to walk you through how you should do multi, the rest of these guys. So you've covered all this right here and you might be I don't know if you've if that's increased your speed or if it's decreased your speed. I don't know. That's up to you. So now we've got a situation where we need to do multicast. Well, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to enable at least three switches here. And I'm going to connect these guys like so. Do a port channel. So now you've got to do VLANs, trunks, port channels, VTP, spanning tree. You connect R1. You connect R2. And then you connect these guys to here. You get R3. You know, you just something along those lines. Now, here's the thing. These are all one big LAN. Now, I want to sit there and I want to take... Okay, let's do R4, connect him off here, connect R5 off here, and then you've got this. Now I can go ahead and I can say, um, maybe I want to do R6, and then connect him to R4, and connect him to this switch and this switch, and then go along those lines. So then I've got maybe R7 over here that's hanging off of R1. So maybe you're doing, um, maybe you're dealing with, uh, what do you call it, multicast. So now, what I would recommend you do is start with RIP. Just make RIP your first, then do OSPF, then do EIGRP. Why do I say it that way? The administrative distance for this is 120. The administrative distance for this is 110, and the administrative distance for this is third is 90 for internal. Because then what you're doing is you're getting RIP up and running, you're getting OSPF up and running and testing out multicast, then you're testing EIGRP. But they all override each other. So you start off with the highest AD, then you go down to OSPF, which is the next lower, then you go to EIGRP, which is lower than that. So even though you've got all three routing processes running at the same time, you're seeing only one IGP output. So then I would take that. 
So now I can go ahead, I can do multicast. So you're gonna see layer two multicast in here. So you're gonna see how the um, the report message comes in from IGMP. You're gonna see about the, the designated forwarder and how um, there's one I'm trying to think of but I can't think of off the top of my head where you have, uh, it doesn't matter. You're going through multicast and you have um, maybe R6 is your rendezvous point out of the gate. But then you find there's a more direct path through R3, and you can bypass R6. You know, so there's different technologies you can run with this. You can test out your different technologies, like you can set up PIM in the core. Then you can go ahead and set up. You can deal with a static RP. You can do auto RP. Then you can do BSR. You can do any cast. Then you can do MSDP. Then you can do uh, multi pro. Uh, you can do multi protocol BGP with the um, IPB or the IPB4. Uh, I believe it's the MDT or no multicast address family. So you can uh, you you can you can test all these technologies out. And now you've tested multicast out, but you've also tested layer two switching. IGP for EIGRP, RIP, OSPF. So now I can go, okay, cool. So do I have to blow away this topology? No, you can keep it. You, do, you don't have to make the topologies huge. I've just given you a for instance on how you could connect it. And then let's see, you got switch one here, you got switch two here, and you got switch three here. Now I can go ahead and I can say, all right, um, well, I'm going to do QoS now. Well, let's say for instance that... Uh, in this particular case, maybe this right here is your ISP. And then you want to make sure that you're doing the customer shaping outbound, you're policing, uh, you're shaping inbound, or policing inbound, um, you're doing all that type of stuff. You're dealing with layer two QoS in the, in the core with different with different features, stuff like that. So you, you've covered multicast, now you're able to cover QoS. So then you can come in here and you can do your services, like you can do DHCP. DNS, you can do all kinds of different things. You know, TFTP, make sure you understand how that works. And then, you know, SSH. And then you can go into security where you can do port security here. You can do authentication of the IGP, you know, then you can do management. You can, you know, copy stuff across the wire. You know, you've given yourself a lot of flexibility, but you're constantly rebuilding. The reason why that's important is because that is what you are going to be doing in any of your exams that you have to do any implementation on, whether it is you know, CCNA, CCMP, or especially CCIE, you're going to have to go through and test this stuff out. You're going to have to show a, especially in the CCA lab, you're going to have to show a, uh, a speed demon, get out of my way, I'm coming through kind of, kind of speed. You got to be lightning fast on the command line. That's why I harp on this stuff, guys. Because you can become very, very good at doing what you're doing. The slow part for a lot of people is going to be going through the material and learning it. Now, do I recommend doing it this way? Absolutely. Go through it, rebuild the topology, follow along with the instructor, see what they're doing. It's how I do it. Whenever I take it, one of the things that I do routinely whenever I am teaching a, a course, let me go ahead and just clear my screen off because of the fact that I want to be able to start off fresh here. One of the things that I do whenever I'm teaching a new course, so for me, one of the things that I'm doing is studying for service provider CCIE right now. Well, I'm doing it in a, in a uh, phased approach where I am going through and I am learning the material, testing it out as I go, which I would recommend you do too. So I, I mentioned earlier about input versus output, right? Well, you got to have input and you've also got to have output. You got to be able to learn it and then be able to demonstrate it, practice it, test it out, make sure it works the way that they booked and the video guy, the guy in the video, like myself sometimes, would say it does. So take this information here and then put it into action. I don't care if you record video, if you take notes, if you do blog posts, I don't care what you do, but do something. I would prefer to see people doing little blogs. But one of the things that you're going to find is the moment you put yourself out on the internet, you're putting out there for people to judge you. So what does that typically do? 
that adds a level of quality that you want to make sure you put into your content because you don't want to be giving bad information. You don't want to be giving information where you're saying, well, I'm really not sure it didn't work the way that I say it does because then people are going to call you out. And then right here, you've got a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You've got a level of, uh, you're accountable, right? You're accountable for what you say. Now it is the internet and you could take the post down if it's, you know, absolutely bat crap crazy wrong, but you know, that's your call. It's your post. So I recommend going out there and at least doing something. I don't care how little or how insignificant it might seem. It's something. Now, if I'm going to be de developing a topology where I want people to test stuff out, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build out a layer two infrastructure. Here's my layer two infrastructure. I've got R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and R6. These guys are all connected to the switching environment. In order for these guys to communicate, they must go through the switch. And the switches must connect with each other. You know, you got R4, you got R5, and you got R6. And then what you do is off of here, then you can go ahead and you can say maybe R7 is a, is a, is a, uh, P, a CE. Then behind here, you could do another level of switching. So you can have, you know, a couple more switches here. And then you can do, maybe you've got R8, you got R9, and you're doing, maybe you're doing some RIP. You, know, you get RIP version 2 over here. And then you've got over here, you've got a connection off to whatever. I don't, I'm just to I'm totally off the top of my head here. Then you can come over here and you can say, I'm going to do R9. And then R9 connects off to ISP1. And ISP1 connects off to R10, R11, and R12. And then you have LAN segments behind each one of those. And then you have, maybe you've got ISP2. And these guys connect to here, but you got to go through two different ISPs to get to where you got to go. And then maybe you've got some R13, R13, maybe you got R14, maybe you got R15, R16. And then what you're doing is these guys are all connected up here. And then maybe you're doing some sort of, you know, I don't know. I'm, again, I'm kind of speculating here. Maybe you've got some switching here in the middle. And then you're doing something along these lines. And you've got, uh, these guys are connecting up here. And, you know, you're, you're doing something along these lines. And then you've got all these interconnections here. So the idea here is you have maybe this big one here in the middle is MPLS. Then you've got RIP. Then you've got maybe EIGRP over here. You've got some EIGRP over here. You've got some BGP here. you got some BGP here. You've got some DMVPN over here. You've got some services over here. So you may get multicast or something. You know, you've got, maybe you've got um, a DMVPN over here. Maybe you've got DMVPN over MPLS. You know, there's multiple ways of doing it. You know, there's, and this is why I bring it up, guys, because this stuff isn't that difficult. And I say that in the terms of you just have to think about it. Now, I don't know if everybody does it this way. You know, this way here gives you a little bit of what I, if I was going to, spell out a lab like this is this how I would build it you never know I might just go out there to screw with you and this is how I want you to deploy the exam remember when you're uh, seeing t topologies in the exams they're not there for real world deployments they're there to test you on your understanding of the technologies that's why they're there so I will get off my high horse now I have spent almost an hour explaining to you the methodologies that I would go through to test these things out and a way to repeatedly go through the material this is what I think works. This is what worked for me. This is how I was able to pass the CCIA lab exam. So, with that being said, 
This was Land Land Show number three. I had a blast putting it together for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Until next time, take it easy, guys.